This is Can I Laugh on Your Shoulder. Hey, welcome to Can I Laugh on Your Shoulder. I'm Molly Stillman, and this is a podcast where I get to sit down with a different guest each week and have raw, funny, often brutally honest conversations about the things that matter most faith, business, life, and everything in between, where we each learn how to be good stewards of the things we've been entrusted with, even our stories, and how we can use those things to serve others and leave our families, our friendships, and our communities a little better than we found them. I want to create a space where people are unafraid to be themselves and unafraid to ask the questions the rest of us are thinking. My goal is to make you laugh, cry, and laugh till you cry. Well, guys, I am still a little bit on vacation this week, but I'm bringing to you another replay. For those of you that have joined the podcast in the past couple of years, you for sure have not heard this episode, but it is one of my all-time favorite episodes, and it really is quite funny because it aired just about exactly three years ago this week, and it is my conversation with Neil Harmon, who at the time was the CEO of VidAngel which is now known as Angel Studios. He is still the CEO of Angel Studios. He's the co-founder of Angel Studios. And if you're like, I think I recognize that name, Angel Studios, you do, because it is the production company that produces shows like The Chosen and also was the production company behind the incredible movie that came out in July called Sound of Freedom. It is crazy to see how far VidAngel slash Angel Studios has come in three years since this episode first aired. It has just blown up. Season four of The Chosen just wrapped up filming. And I believe this conversation originally aired during, well, it originally aired during COVID. And that was right when season one was kind of beginning to take up, you know, pick up steam. I am still a super fan of The Chosen. My family loves it. I talk about it all the time. I've gotten everybody I know (laughs) to watch the show because it is that good. So I thought it would be just perfect since this conversation aired three years ago and Angel Studios has been in the news a lot lately for you to hear this conversation that I did three years ago because it really will show you where they were if you have been following their work now. So without further ado, enjoy my conversation that originally aired on July 29th, 2020, my conversation with Neil Harmon, the CEO of Angel Studios. Neil, I am so honored to have you on the show today. How are you, sir? I'm honored to be on your show, Molly. Thanks for having me on. Well, I, you know, I came, I will be completely honest, uh, when the first time I ever kind of came across any of your work, um, and I'm going to take it back a little bit, uh, was when you worked on the viral uh, poopery campaign. <laughs> <laughs> back in, I guess it was like 2013 or something like that. Yes. That started in 2013. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was shortly after my husband and I got married and I will never forget. My husband was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad he liked it. I know. I know. I mean, and it's, it's one of those campaigns that like people are like, oh yeah, the British woman with the, with the poop spray, you know? So this is how we're starting the show off. It's great. So, but you know, you've obviously, you've done a lot um, and you uh, are just, you have started uh, incredible businesses. You're doing incredible work. And so I want to hear all about you. So give us the Neil 101. So tell us who you are, uh, what you do and kind of how you got to where you are today. So that's a great question. And um, I think I'd have to go back to being a, an Idaho farm boy and Growing up in Idaho, I worked on dairy farms and tried to start my own little cattle business. And uh, as I got older and learned more about the world, I ended up getting into uh, web businesses and uh, had a spectacular failure coming out of college. And then I did a, a company called Aura Brush, which was a tongue cleaner that got rid of bad breath. And um, it, we went from zero sales to global distribution in a couple of years because of marketing on YouTube. And then after that started, uh, well, we had a company that reached out to my brother and I, who uh, were co-founders of Aura Brush to help them market, like you said, poopery. And uh, that poopery ad campaign became so successful, it, it, it ended up turning us into an ad agency. And 
against our better judgment, that ad agency, ad agency ended up being called Harmon Brothers, just kind of by accident. And, th at this, and then shortly after that, um, we started VidAngel, which is something we just wanted for our own families. There are a lot of boys in my family, and that we're, we're, we are nine children, six boys and three girls, and four of the brothers were talking and said, hey, we want to we wanna create this product for our own families. And uh, that's kind of how VidAngel began. So that's, that's uh, my career in a nutshell. I love it. Now, for people who may not be familiar with VidAngel, what is it? It's, I know that it's a streaming, streaming service and uh, kind of tell us how that got started and, and what exactly it is, how it works. Okay. So uh, like I said, it was four brothers who wanted to solve this problem for our own families. And I think a, a story is the best way to, um, to share why it's important to me. So one of my favorite movies uh, of all time is called Cinderella Man. And this movie is about the Great Depression and a boxer who goes through hard times and nearly loses his children. And one of his kids steals a salami. And then this boxer takes his child back to the salami shop and, and asks him to, to return it and to, you know, come clean and then tells him afterwards, we don't steal. Even though they were almost starving, they don't steal in their family. I love this movie because it, it portrays people having character even in their darkest moments. And I wanted our kids to see this movie. This movie has a coach in it who has a mouth on him. Yeah. And, and he's from New York. And I love the guy. He's, he, the actor who portrays him is fantastic. And, uh, but he uses words that we, you know, for our young kids, we didn't want repeated in our home. We didn't want our son and daughter using these words with each other. Yeah. So, but we want him to see that story. So VidAngel allows you to take popular movies and TV shows and skip over stuff you find inappropriate for your own home. Um, it's kind of like a pre-programmed remote and it works really well. People really, really love this product. The reason that we started VidAngel is broader than that. We wanted to start this company to have an impact on media and on the world. And we saw that if we could find the people who it's important enough to them to protect their families, that they would use a technology that they could skip over stuff, that we would have a group of people that we could also distribute content to and do a better job of creating content for them than Hollywood is doing today. Yeah, yeah. So that's... that's uh, it's kind of the genesis of what VidAngel does and what we want to achieve as a company. So I love, I love that. And I love that it all started because it was something that you just wanted for your own families. And then you figured, hey, if this is something that our family wants, there's probably other families that want this too. And I definitely echo that. I mean, my kids are six and four and well, my daughter's almost seven. And, uh, you know, something that we have, uh, instituted during quarantine actually has been family movie nights on yeah. Sunday nights. And my husband and I, you know, we've, we've watched all the, you know, all the hits, but then we've started to want to go back and kind of show our kids the movies we loved as a kid. And, and it's funny because now as a parent and I'm looking at some of the movies I watched as a kid and I'm like, why was I allowed to watch that? Like, this is, <laughs> I don't think this was actually okay for me to watch. Like one of my favorite movies of all time is the movie Airplane. I love Airplane. It's the <laughs> funniest movie. I watched that movie when I was like eight and I'm yeah. thinking like, I'm like, it is definitely not appropriate for an eight-year-old i mean it doesn't have the f word but i mean it has definitely some really questionable content yes I'm watching it at eight and i'm thinking <laughs> to myself, like, there's no way i would let my kids watch airplane right now right and but it's it's my kids ask me about it because they know it's my favorite movie and my husband and i quote it and you know and then even movies like the goonies like the goonies yes. the classic there's so much language in the Goonies. And I had no <laughs> idea. And I, I don't know if we were just oblivious as kids. I don't know. But so that's definitely been something that my husband and I have had conversations about it. Like at what age are we comfortable like letting them see the Goonies? Or like at what age can we really begin to introduce movies that might have some language and be able to have conversations. I'm like, I don't want to have that conversation yet with my four-year-old. And so there are definitely have been times where I'm like, man, I just wish that there was like a clean version of this movie. And then you have a service 
uh, like Bit Angel. So I just, I, I love that, that the greater mission too, is just that you wanted to have, you know, a positive impact on media and the world. And, you know, even as like, quote unquote, you know, the inappropriate parts of Airplane, it's still like, you don't see movies like Airplane get made today. Like, that's like clean compared to what a lot of the media is, yeah. is getting made today. Yeah, our society has changed so much. And we think at VidAngel, we think it's due to a broken feedback loop in Hollywood. Mm, mm. So um, the the creators in Hollywood love to see who wins the Oscars. Uh, they want they love to see who wins the awards. And so they come back every year and see who wins the awards, pat each other on the back, but they're essentially making movies for each other. And as a result, what we have happen is, is that about three-fourths of the revenue in the box office comes from the family-friendly movies, but Hollywood's making more than half of their titles um, rated R. And so they're not really listening to what the audience is saying to them. And uh, we feel like VidAngel bridges this gap where it gives creators a feedback loop where they listen to what the audience is truly wanting. And if the audience skips over a scene inside of Airplane or a scene inside of Goonies or, or language inside of Goonies, they can learn, oh, wait a second, maybe I don't need to use the F word so many times in my film because it actually affects my market. And I'm listening to the audience rather than listening to my peers in, in the Grammys. That's kind of what we think is is the problem. That is fascinating. And I, I honestly, I think until you articulated it that way, I think that's just the best way I've ever heard it said is that it, the broken feedback loop. And, it, you know, it's interesting that every year, I mean, I don't really watch the Oscars anymore, but I, I'm always curious as to who wins what. And my husband and I were talking, I guess it was either this year or last year, where I was like, I have not heard of any of these movies. Like, when did these movies come out? Like, all these movies that are winning all the awards. And I'm like, I'll be honest, like, the only ones I've seen this year are like Toy Story and uh, Frozen, because <laughs> I have a six and a four year old. So, like, that's what we've seen. Um, but, the, you know, the reality is, is like, you know, all these movies that keep getting made, you're right. It's like they're all just getting kind of made for themselves. And I'm not saying that there's not great movies in some of those, but sure, um, sure. But it's just yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, this the when they, they put the speed limit sign in, in the kindergarten zone or the next to the school, um, there were some people in California who were trying to figure out how to get people to slow down near school zones. And they try speed traps, they try blinking lights, they try bigger signs. None of these things worked. People were just ignoring that feedback. But as soon as they put up a sign that said, here's, here's the speed limit, and then they put up another sign that said, here's how fast you're going, they saw the speed limits go down or the people drop over 10%. And it was because they, they had immediate feedback. They could see what was happening. And uh, that's what we feel like is missing in the system is, is that feedback loop where they listen to the audience. And because the big studios own the distribution channels, they can mm -hmm. kind of just fill those distribution channels with what they choose. But the beautiful thing about the internet is it provides an opportunity for those of us who don't have a voice in the big distribution channels to uh, have a voice um, for ourselves and, and create content for ourselves, which... I know you want to talk about The Chosen today, and yeah. I think that's a great example of that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I definitely want to talk about The Chosen. Uh, but my last question kind of before we get to that is, you know, anytime you are doing something positive, anytime you are doing something to impact the world, there's always going to be resistance. And um, I, I will say, like, I have really admired the way that you have handled a lot of the controversy that you've faced and, and the struggles that you've faced, and you've really taken uh, just a really positive approach to it and your attitude towards it. And, and, and I, so I don't know if you'd be willing to just kind of share a little bit about what that's been like and kind of going through uh, some struggles and, and facing um, pushback. Because anytime you take on giants in the media, you're going to face pushback. And um, I've just, like I said, I just have really admired the way that you have, you've approached it. And so I'd love for you to just kind of share a little bit about that. Oh, thank you, Molly. So um, if you don't mind me asking, how what what month did you start this podcast in 2016? Uh, I the first episode came out in September 2016. Okay, so in September of 2016, um, we were three months into a lawsuit with the Walt Disney Company. Yeah, and um, which was a shock to us because mm -hmm. 
before we started our service, we wrote the Walt Disney Company and said, hey, we're making this service. It's going to make you money. Here's how it works. Here's the information we have on the users we've tested it with. And we'd love your feedback. And if you think that what we're doing is not lawful, then you need to let us know. But we think it is. And here's the reasons why. We got no response from them until a year after when we were growing like crazy and families were enjoying what we were providing. They sued us. About two weeks after, we asked our customers whether they'd be interested in investing in VidAngel to grow the next stage of the company. And so we asked and, and our investors, and our customers said, we'd love to put in over $60 million mm -hmm. into this company to help it grow. And two weeks after that, Disney sued us. That has been now four years. So we, as long as your podcast has existed, we have been locked into legal battle. I don't know how many umpteenth depositions I've done. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've ever been in a lawsuit, but it is it truly a war of words. And it's a war on what we feel like is sandy ground in, in California where nothing goes our way. Our attorneys are shocked at the way that we're treated in court because they work in California and they, yeah. they don't. They're, they're, they're shocked by the way that things go down. And uh, it has been a long, long haul. Yeah. So I'm glad that I didn't know, Molly, at the beginning how, <laughs> how hard this was going to be. I'm not, I'm not sure I'd have the strength to take it yeah, on. But yeah. at this point, here we are. We feel like I mentioned that we got sued. And then we said to our customers, hey, would, would you like us to take this to the Supreme Court? Because we don't know how we're going to survive without more financing. But we're but we would take this to the Supreme Court if you invest $5 million in the company. Well, they invested $10 million in five days. Wow. And, uh, and so we were able to uh, improve on the product and uh, fight this legal battle. So it's been rough. It's been hard. Um, but um, I think it's been worth it when I see some of the fruits of what's happened because of, the, the, because of these investors, because yeah. of the families that, have, that are customers, because of people like you who, um, who help in this cause, I mean, all we're trying to do is create a space for our families that we get to have the say. Yeah. And, uh, and so it, it feels worth it. And it feels like because there's so many other people who want us to do it and who are praying for us that we are given extra strength to fight mm. this fight. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, uh, and just know that you do have a lot of people on your side and, um, and just, and, you know, who are fighting with you and for you. And um, I appreciate uh, your, your honesty and, and, and all of that throughout that. And I know that it's a continuing battle, but, you know, I can't help but like, just think about how so often, whenever, like I said, like whenever you're, you're pursuing something that in a lot of ways that God has called you to do. Um, we know as believers that like that Jesus didn't promise us an e easy life. And, uh, and that anytime that we, we are, you know, doing something that God's called us to, that there's going to be challenge, um, but that he will carry us through it. And we have to be prepared that the outcome isn't what we expect it to be. Yeah. I don't think Christ's disciples at the time expected him to be crucified then. Mm -hmm. They, yep. they, you know, they thought that he had God's blessing and everything was going to turn out okay, which it did. Yeah. In the eternal sense. Yeah. But I don't, I, I think that must have been extremely hard on them. And so that's one of the hard things here is that I'm like, I don't know that this is going to be a happy ending. I mean, right now we had a ruling in the California courts that we have to pay 62 million. That's an interesting number given that's what the customers wanted to invest. Hmm. But uh, we have to pay a $62 million bill. And um, our company's growing enough that uh, we propose to pay it off in the court. Yeah. And then have the right to appeal that ruling. And guess what Disney did? They said, no, we'll go ahead and lower the bill by $50 million. But you don't have the right to appeal. You can't challenge this ruling. Huh. You can't filter or skip over our stuff without our permission. And um, I don't know how this is going to turn out, Molly. I hope it has a happy ending for you and for me. But um, yeah. it might just be one of those battles that. Um, has an, an eternal win rather than yeah. the one <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh goodness. It's kind of like, um, and I don't remember off the top of my head what, uh, what particular verse it is, but there's a, a, a verse in the new Testament where that just kind of alludes to this, this idea of the meantime. And that there's this, this, this sense of sometimes you're kind of in the meantime, you're in the midst of it and you don't know what the end result is going to be. And, and it's just, you're in the meantime right now. <laughs> and you're just 
you know, you're just kind of continuing to row that boat. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I think that actually kind of leads me perfectly to when I think about the boat, I think about the miracle of the loaves and the fish, and I think about the chosen. And uh, for those that that don't have not heard of the chosen, uh, the chosen is VidAngel's first uh, original series, and it is going to be a multi-season series, and it is based on the gospels, and it is kind of come from comes from the perspective of the disciples, um, and it's about the life of Jesus. And uh, the first season is currently out; it's eight episodes, and there's a couple really unique things about this. Not only is it, you know, available, it's a, it's a VidAngel original. It is the highest grossing uh, crowdfunded media project of all time, which is yes. unbelievable. So, I mean, it's an entire production that has been funded by people. And it's just, it's just amazing to me. And um, my husband and I, I said this before we started recording, we, we binged to Jesus uh, a few weeks ago. <laughs> And I, I don't honestly even know how I had first come across it or heard about it. I don't know if somebody had mentioned it, but I was like, hey, this is interesting. And I thought it was also a really unique way to view it because basically you download an app and you watch it through the app, but then you can like stream it onto your Apple TV or your Roku. Or I mean, I you think you can even watch it on YouTube. So it's just a really unique way of consuming the content. And so I said, oh, I want to check this out. And I was blown away. And I remember I cry every episode. I can't stop talking about it. It's just one of the best things I've ever seen. And so I would love for you because you've kind of been involved in the process of The Chosen since the beginning. So yes. kind of share how you got involved with it and where this whole idea even came from. Yeah. So I, I first want to address, um, you, you know, many people don't get around to I I've, I've I have friends that I've been trying to get to watch the chosen for over a year because it came out in November but I had early cuts of it um, during the pre-release uh, season and uh, I can't get people to watch it because <laughs> they're like not another show about Jesus or not another show about the Bible this is going to be dull and boring mm -hmm. um, so this is our first scripted series. Our first original series was called, it's called Dry Bar, and it does a, over a billion views a year. And it's a stand-up comedy series. When we did that stand-up comedy series and we were able to outperform all the other studios in the digital space, we learned that if we take the data from people's skip choices, that they will be, that they, that will create a bigger market because the comedians will read that data. They'll say, oh, I'm going to take this out of my act, or I'm going to, I'm going to adjust my act so I can make more money. And that's what they're doing. And it was a bigger market. It grew, it, like I said, it's over a billion views a year. And we said, okay, now let's see what, we wanna do a real TV series now, something that's more expensive. What are we gonna do? And uh, a friend of ours introduced us to uh, a little uh, short film made by Dallas Jenkins. And um, my brother, who's in charge of uh, content at VidAngel, uh, Jeffrey, he sh shared this short with me and he says, this is a show about the birth of Christ. And I, I think we should consider doing this for our, you know, our first scripted series. And I said, no, we're not going to do a show about the, basically the same response that I get from my friends. We're not going to do another show about the Bible. That's not our job. <laughs> we're an entertainment company. That's the job of a church. You know, churches are, that's their mission is to go and, and preach the gospel. And uh, it's not, you know, it's not, that shouldn't be for a for-profit company. Anyway, he just said, just go ahead and watch it. And I went and put on my headphones and I watched this short. And the entire office, everyone around me just disappeared. And I was there for the birth of Christ through the eyes of that shepherd. And because I grew up in Idaho and I grew up farming animals, I, like it hit me on a level that I was not expecting. And, and when I, Jeffrey, looked at me after I took off my headphones. And I looked at him. I'm sure I had tears in my eyes. He, he, and I said, I, I think this is the reason we created VidAngel is to get behind a project like wow. this. And uh, I finally saw it. And what's exciting is, is that I think everybody that watches it is going through that same moment where they're just like, I never knew I needed this. I didn't know that the world needed this. Mm -hmm. Oh, but how the world needs this. Ugh. And um, and that's what The Chosen is. And I think the reason that The Chosen has so much 
of just a good spirit about it is because I think that a lot of the people who are making it and the distributor who is getting behind it are going through similar trials and facing similar situations into modern society as what the disciples of Christ faced mm-hmm. then. I, I would never compare ourselves to the disciples of Christ, but back then and what they went through, I mean, they were, they were martyred for, mm-hmm. for the cause. You know, we're just, we're in a war of words, but at least we don't have to be hanged or yeah. whatnot for what we're doing. But that said, there's a special spirit about it because everybody's fighting so hard to create this and they want their voice to be represented in, in modern media and, and not, just, not just to be affirmed, mm-hmm. but to actually just be taken into a story and the story to be powerfully written and to be compelling and the right timing and the camera work to be done well and the production value to be good. Yes. We need that. Yes. We need that. And now people see that we need that and, they, and they're experiencing it. And we have a lot more exciting things coming not only just seasons uh, two through and on on the chosen but this has awakened in a lot of people a desire to change to change media Mm -hmm. and uh and and we are so excited about the future molly Oh, thank you for sharing all of that with me. Um, and I can just say as, as a fan of the show and a fan of, of the work, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I think I remember when I first came across it, I was like, oh, I, I think I had that same feeling where I was like, not another show about Jesus. Like, and, and let's be honest, like a lot of quote unquote, like Christian media that gets made today is cheesy. It's poorly (laughs) written. It's poorly produced. And it's just like, it gives you the cringy factor. And you're like, "Oh, oh gosh, is this really our best work? And I was nervous. And I think the other thing too, is like, you know, I really liked shows like uh, The Bible and The AD Show, like those shows that were done on, it was like NBC or ABC a couple years ago. Um, And I thought that they were well done. And there's been other shows about Jesus or or not, you know, kind of series about Jesus, but mini series about Jesus. But one of my pet peeves is, is it's always so serious. And Jesus is portrayed very, very serious. And you never see him smile and you never see him laugh. And there's this humanity that is taken out of him. And I, I respect the, I I understand that there needs to be a certain reverence and all those kinds of things. But at the same time, like if, if Jesus was fully God and fully human, let's show the human side of him. And I think that is one of the things that I love so much about The Chosen is is first and foremost, the portrayal of Jesus. Um, yeah. Jonathan Rumi as Jesus, is he's fantastic. And yeah. he's funny and he is endearing. And he is, when he walks on screen, I can't help but smile because <laughs> the way that he just interacts with people and I, I cry like half the time. I mean, his portrayal is just fantastic. And I know that that has been really intentional. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and why that was something that you guys really wanted to make sure you incorporate into the show? So Dallas, the director of The Chosen and creator of The Chosen, and Jonathan Rumi have a history of working together for a number of years. Oh, wow. And so when, when we heard, when we decided we were going to get behind this project and helped uh, The Chosen raise over... $11 million from over 19,000 people. Dallas said to us, we started suggesting to him, you know, different contacts were sending us really famous people to play Jesus or whatnot. And Dallas said, no, I know who's going to be Jesus. I just want you to watch a few clips. And, and I did. And I thought, yeah, I think, because there's this really famous name. There was a, a billionaire who said, hey, I've got contact with a really famous name who can play Jesus. And I was kind of excited to hear that. And I thought, oh, cool. This would really, you know, get lend credence to the show. And then Dallas showed me the character, he, the, the, the actor he had in mind, Jonathan Rumi. And I watched that. And suddenly I was, the thought of this super famous actor, I mean, I'm not going to say a name, super famous. The thought of him being Jesus suddenly became like, it made my stomach churn after seeing Jonathan Rumi's portrayal and, and understanding what kind of a person he was. Yeah. And, uh, and so there was no going back at that point, And I was so excited about it. But here's the moment for me, Molly, is I took my whole family down to the set in, in Texas to participate in the filming of the wedding at Cana. And if, if you want to see our cameo, there's a 
a moment where Jesus is playing with the children yeah. with the, with the, with the, at the, at the table. Yeah. And, um, those, uh, except for one of them are our kids. Oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah. So we, uh, the, the one who looks the most like she could be from Israel, she was four or five at the time. I think she was four. Anyway, we had the, the night, the shoots were all night long. And so we had to acclimate our family. We, we, we flew down to, to Dallas and then we stayed at a hotel and we acclimated our family to get ready to do all night shoots for this, for this scene. And, Cause there were like three all night shoots and, um, and we thought we were ready, but the four year old by like one thirty, two o'clock in the morning, she just said, I'm done. I'm, I want to go home. I don't want to be here anymore. I'm done. I take me home, take me home. And she just started screaming. Yeah. And, uh, and my wife was trying to get her to calm down. And then they, r- right at that moment, they say, it's time. It's time for the kids to do their scene. And there was no way. It's like she was, she was the one that they needed. You know, she had dark hair. She has more olive skin. And uh, they, they <laughs> there was no way she was going. So I go and I try to talk to her. I can't convince her to go onto the <laughs> set. So Jonathan comes out and he learns that she's struggling. And uh, he comes out and starts talking to her. And she doesn't even know who he is. He starts talking to her. And then he kind of, as he's talking to her, brings her onto the set without her realizing that it's happening. And then he starts playing the game. And they were rolling cameras. And she didn't, um, you, 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 they did the little thing where they hide the, the peas and they move the little cups. And, and at the very end, all the kids were like, I know where it is. I know where it is. And then, and then Jonathan says, just a moment. We need to hear from, I won't say her name just for her own uh, privacy, yeah. but uh, let's call her um, Elizabeth. Um, uh-huh. So let, we, we, need to, we need to hear from Beth. And <laughs> my daughters, he said, what do you think, Beth? Uh, where's the, the pee? And she, she looks at him right in the eyes, just like with this look of defiance. And she says, I know where it is, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> 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 and Jonathan just starts laughing and he's just like, oh, and so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna catch a break. You don't even know who, <laughs> who I'm playing. Anyway, it was just this great moment and she was had changed and she no longer was sad and she was wow. playing and she was having this marvelous time. Anyway, when we got done and we left, my wife and I looked at each other and we just said, you know what? That's probably how Jesus would have handled it in the same kind of yeah. situation. So Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's just so many um, just fantastic moments in the show where you just, I mean, one, another person I just think, there's a couple portrayals in particular that I just think are fantastic. Um, I hope I'm saying his name right, but Shahar Isaac. Shahar, um, who, yes. Shahar, yeah. Shahar he Isaac. Was, who, he was born in Nazareth. Yeah. I mean, he, his portrayal of Simon Peter is fantastic. And even my husband, he's like, that's exactly how I picture Peter. It's just like, <laughs> ready to go at all times, like a little bit combative, just like <laughs> amped at every moment. Like that is Shahar Isaac's portrayal and it's fantastic. I mean, I love, there's an exchange uh, for people who haven't seen the show. There's this particular exchange between Jesus and, and, and Simon and uh, where he says, you know, something about like, don't you know what I'm thinking? And Jesus says like, everybody knows what you're thinking. It doesn't take like, <laughs> it doesn't take God's wisdom to know that. And it's just like his sense of humor as Jesus is, <laughs> fantastic um and then additional uh, uh paris patel as matthew is yes. just oh he's fantastic his portrayal yeah. of, as matthew is so good and you know another thing that i really love about the show because people say like well is the show biblical and obviously yes like you know you're taking stories like real stories from scripture and you're putting them on the screen but you know, we all we all know that the Bible gives us just really the highlights, That's and right. it doesn't give us the backstory. It doesn't give us as much of the kind of filler content. Like, and I love the way that the Chosen has really given you a sense of who were these people before they met Jesus. And so you yes. see Mary Magdalene, and you get the flashbacks of her as a child, and then um, the demons that she's facing as an adult, and and her first meeting of Jesus, and then and then you see. Like I think the the whole approach of of uh, you know Simon Peter is, and Andrew are in trouble with with the tax with the Romans and the taxes and you know so it makes the scene with the fish in the boat that much more meaningful because of 
of where they were financially at that point. And then you see uh, kind of how Matthew, you know, how he gets to the point of where he's following Jesus. And then you're even briefly introduced to Thomas. And I love that Thomas is even kind of just doubtful of everything, no matter what, <laughs> like it's just, um, you know, so you, you get this sense of who these people were as people. Um, and it's beautifully done. Oh, oh, oh goodness. Oh, I cannot help but mention too, but, um, Peter and then seeing his wife, Eden, oh, and yes. understanding that he was married and then seeing his, his mother-in-law and what that must've been like for him as a husband to, to have to make the decision to sacrifice parts of his family in order to follow Christ. And it's just amazing. And so I, I would love for you to just kind of share if you can, um, you know, what has kind of gone into that process of, um, obviously through a lot of prayer, time spent in the word, and, and also looking at historical context, um, who these people were historically and, and looking at, you know, how do you kind of come up with the content to make those decisions, to make those people who they are? Yeah, it's, a, it's such a fantastic question. And one of one of my one of our family's favorite things to do when we watched season one of the chosen was to go back to the New Testament, mm -hmm, yeah, and try to pick out what was creative license and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. And it was shocking for us how many times we thought Dallas and the the writers were taking creative license, but it was actually in the scriptures, right? Yeah. I mean, they've really, really done a good job of uh, making this coordinate with the scriptures and those backstories. What they're the, the standard they're looking for is that it's plausible, that mm -hmm. it doesn't contradict scripture, yeah, and that it's plausible. But the goal is to make it so we can relate to it, yeah, that we can see these stories through our own experiences and the things that we struggle with, mm -hmm. and. Oh, I better not talk about that. I'm going to get emotional. But I, um, there's a note um, that we recently got from somebody who that morning was on the verge of um, committing suicide. And um, they happened to come across The Chosen right before their, that moment and uh, watched episode one. And when they saw when they saw someone be that close to mm -hmm. uh, taking their own life on this show, they changed their mind right there. And that's the, I mean, that's the kind of stuff where these characters become very real, that we suddenly understand that Jesus is relevant to our lives and he is a solution. And sometimes that's hard to do in a, in a society that's um, so based off of the scientific method and based off of what, how things can be known, but we need we need the hope that comes from redemption and from um, outside of ourselves. And, and they've just done a beautiful job of, of telling stories in a way that we can understand. But the goal, and for me, I mean, that's the one thing that I would say is, is um, that the, both the scriptures and the chosen, their only goal is to lead us to understanding who he was and, 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 and that he, is our, he, he redeems us. And um, if we don't get there, or if we get off the mark, or, or or we get too caught up into how good these actors are, or you know how famous the show becomes, then we've missed the mark. What? But um, but as soon as the, it takes us into the scriptures and then gets us into a relationship with Christ, then it'll have been a successful project. And which sounds a little bit like church, uh, you know. I hate to, you know, I have to <laughs> I have to preface that by saying we are a for-profit company. We need to make a profit on this show, and, yeah. and we need to make a return for investors. And that's the way that we get more content like this created is because these really wonderful creators are able to afford to do so. So they've done a good job. They have a, a biblical committee to that they review things with. They've made trips to Israel to study. Mm. Uh, by, uh, Dallas Jenkins was a Bible a major, major in college. Uh, I think he attended Liberty. And so th that is a very much a goal of theirs is to, is to stay true to the word. Yeah. Um, but this is the primary goal is to be really entertaining, to pull lots of people into the story and then, then lead people to the scriptures. So he, there are a few people, it's very, very few who they get focused on tearing it apart or saying it doesn't match this part of the Bible, or, or they get worried because there's people of different faiths involved, and they're somehow subliminally, you know, getting across messages that aren't true or whatnot. But this is not that. This is not what this project's about. This project's just about telling the stories of Jesus in a way that we can all relate to, and uh, and that hopefully it can lead all people of all faiths and people that don't have faith to our Redeemer.
Yeah. Amen. Amen to that. And yeah, I, I think that has been one of the things that's been most encouraging to me is like what I think about, like I've already watched it the whole series twice. I never do that with a show. Like there's so few shows where I watch it and then I go, I immediately want to watch that again. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I'm interested. And it's so being- layered. It's yes. so layered. So you can go you back. I've watched things. it three times and you realize, oh, wait a second. I did not know that was there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. It's funny because my husband actually, admittedly, he didn't love the first episode. That was not his favorite. When we first watched it through, he's like, oh, I thought it was okay. I mean, I liked it. And then we watched the second episode and he was hooked by that second yes. episode. And we went back and rewatched the first episode after we watched all eight. eight. And he was like, oh, wow, now that I've seen it and I I really see everything that they were setting up and um, I understand it more now. And he's like, oh, now I, I, there's just so many deep um, I was with him. Moments in it. it was the yeah. same for me. Episode two is the one who, that got me too. Yep. Episode one was a little, it was, it was a little dark and, uh, and, and it was harder. But once I got to the end of two, I was just like, whoa, that, that, that scene with Matthew and his family, I, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I completely echo your sentiments. Yeah. And I tell people too, I'm like, because I tell them like, you have to watch this show. I don't care if you're not a Christian. Like it just, it's so good. Like, please watch this show. I mean, I say, and make sure you watch episode two, like just get through episode one. Not that episode one is bad, but it is yes. definitely of the eight. It's it a is, setup. It's, it's a, a setup. setup. There's a lot going on. Yeah. There's a lot happening in episode yeah. one. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, it's just, again, it's beautiful. It is. Um, and the other thing too that I've loved about it is it is something that I actually, I feel comfortable showing to my kids. I did not show episode one to my daughter. I feel like that would be a little bit too much for her. But um, we actually, we sat down the other day because we were reading the story of the wedding at Cana. And I said, hey, do you want to watch this episode with me of The Chosen of the wedding at Cana? And she loved it. And it was just so precious to watch her watch that episode. And and even my son, I remember at one point, like uh, there was like a scene in that episode where they're stomping in the grapes. And my son's like, I've never walked in grapes before. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yeah, right. And then I remember... Um, I pointed out Thomas and I said, you guys, that, that character right there, that's Thomas who becomes the disciple uh, doubting Thomas. And my, my son, my four-year-old, he's like, I know Thomas, like from the choo-choo trains, choo-choo, Thomas. <laughs> like, I don't know, different, different one. Um, but in general, like, you know, my, my daughter, my almost seven-year-old, like she's had really great questions while watching it. And we've read a lot of these stories that for her to be able to see it kind of act it out, it's bringing the Bible to life for her as well. So it, yes, it's just, we, we, we were at the, uh, the national religious broadcasters conference and, um, we showed a pre-release of episodes, episode one and, or maybe we showed all one through four. I can't remember, but we showed a pre-release. Yeah. And the guy who was doing the, um, the lighting and all the technical work, told us afterwards, he said, I almost lost track of my job Mm -hmm. because he says, I'm not a believer, but oh, I just stopped doing my job because I was so taken in by this story. And I hope that if there's anyone on your, on on your podcast, Molly, who are, are counting this out, they, they, they need to watch the show just, just because it is a very well done show. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's, yeah, the, the acting is incredible. Um, the production's incredible. The writing is fantastic. Uh, get used to different, get used to different. <laughs> oh, oh, it's so good. So clearly I could talk about this all day. Um, but, uh, uh, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, but just, you know, for, for people that are interested in, uh, supporting the chosen, um, and do you kind of, can you, is there anything that you can kind of share about? Um, I know that with the coronavirus and everything, a lot of things were kind of put on hold. Is there anything that you can share about kind of what is on the horizon for the chosen? I better be careful. (laughs) The the good things are on the horizon. Yeah. we, as you know, we've had tremendous success. A lot of people backing it, paying it forward is the, what we call it, uh, to where they can pay it forward so other people can watch it for free and help fund season two. And if you look at the, the charts on the app, you can see that we are well on our way to funding season two. And we're just thrilled about that. The scripts for one through four are complete. Like they, 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 they're, they're ready to be produced. And 
you know, we could use prayers on, on this coronavirus situation. That's kind of shut down Hollywood. And as much as we say we're not part of Hollywood, we still need to film and we need to, you know, we need to have a place to film and people to be in close proximity with each other to, in order to film. And so we're hoping that that can happen this summer. Uh, you can watch VidAngel, you, you know, your daughter who's four, she can watch uh, the, the Chosen on VidAngel and skip that scene about the possession or whatnot if, she, if, if that's the best for her. We, we skip that scene for our own little kids because it's too scary for them. You can also download the Chosen app and you can watch the Chosen right now for free on either VidAngel or the Chosen app. So uh, download the app and give it a shot. And like Molly said, make sure you get through at least episode two before yeah. before and you decide to not go forward. Yeah, absolutely. And you will, I promise you, you will be hooked. Um, my <laughs> husband and I, we, we, we like when we finished it, we paid it forward and we're just like, what else can we do to make sure that this gets made as soon as possible? <laughs> Um, okay. Well, before we go, I just have a couple of fun, get to know you questions, uh, just to, to close out. This is one of my favorite parts of the show. So Neil, are you ready for the, uh, get to know you round? Oh, well, we'll see. Okay. I, I, I haven't heard it. This is going to be fun. <laughs> All right. If you had to eat the same meal for dinner every night for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, that's a great question. So there's, uh, I don't know if people on this audience would uh, be familiar with it, but there's this, um, uh, what do we call it? Anyway, it's quinoa with uh, avocado and tomato and lime and a little bit of, um, and then sunflower seeds and stuff on top of it. It's just super good. Mm, so good. I love that. That sounds meal. really I good. Anything with avocado. I'm like, yes, you had, it's you the heavenly food. It it's really the heavenly is. food. <laughs> it really is. I um I live in North Carolina. We can't grow avocado trees here. Um, but I have been to um been on many trips to Kenya and some of my dear friends in Kenya, they just have these avocado trees that just are they have avocados at their like they can walk out their back door and just pick, <laughs> like I, I'm going to move to Kenya just so I can have an avocado tree in my I, backyard. I, ser I, I served a mission in Mexico. <laughs> and when I was there, I could buy a, an avocado that's bigger than anything you could ever buy at Costco for two pesos, which at the time was like 20 cents. Yeah. And you could just eat like they're oh. so big that they are an entire meal on their own. And I, I was in heaven. Yes. The best. The best. Um, okay. What is a dream that you have yet to achieve? So uh, my wife and I, we, we have nine living children, and, um, which is a huge family. And we, we've, uh, she's always wanted to have a huge family. And I uh, love our family. My dream is that every single one of those kids can um, learn to speak to God and hear his voice through the scriptures. And if every one of them can do that in this life, then my, my life will be complete. Mm, I love that. I, as a parent, I also have that, uh, that dream. So thank you for sharing that. Okay. What was your favorite TV show to watch growing up? So I didn't do TV a lot because I grew up on a farm and we mostly just did movies and didn't have time for TV. I will admit that uh, when I went to school, one of my favorite uh, shows to watch was The Simpsons. <laughs> I love The Simpsons. <laughs> And, 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 and you created Vin Angel, and I wasn't uh, allowed to watch The Simpsons growing up. <laughs> I know. I, I wasn't allowed to watch The Simpsons either. This is me leaving to school and uh, watching it on my own. But I love the, the political satire. And there's Simpsons episodes that, you know, I had to, I had, I had to shut off. But I, just, the writing was so good on The Simpsons. I just, I, I, that was one of my, you know, my vices to come home from school and, and uh, watch an episode of The Simpsons. I love that. That is fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, okay. My last question, and this is the question I ask all my guests, and that is, uh, what does it mean to you to run a business with purpose? I think that it means that you find in your work meaning in what is greater than yourself or will live beyond what you do or what you say or how much money you make. And it will have some kind of impact on the world uh, for good that you can be happy with and uh, not have regrets about. Mm, that's a great answer. Neil, this has been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I Pleasure's am just, mine. I'm just cheering you on. And uh, I am 
anxiously awaiting season two of The Chosen. And also, I'm really excited to see other original content that VidAngel produces. And to if, if the bar has been set by The Chosen, it's a pretty high <laughs> bar. So <laughs> only- we have some great stuff coming. I'm, yes. I'm convinced. There are so many talented people. You made a little chiding remark about Christian projects. But <laughs> no. when, 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 the, uh, when the distribution channels locked out, so that yeah. you don't have the way you don't have the funds, then it is hard. But yeah. uh, but w- the chosen is paving the way for for another form of distribution that will allow great stories that are of faith to be made at a high production level. So we're yeah. you and I are both super excited about it. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you, Molly. Okay, friend, I would love to know what you loved about this episode or maybe something that you learned. If you do, let me know on social media. You can find me at Still Being Molly or at Business With Purpose Podcast on Instagram or Facebook. And don't forget to use that hashtag Business With Purpose Podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you are a first time listener of the show, welcome. Be sure to visit the archives for past shows featuring incredible entrepreneurs and business owners who are literally changing the world with their businesses. And if you are a regular listener of the show. Thank you so much for tuning in week in and week out. And thank you for your support. Be sure to head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Radio Public, or wherever you listen to podcasts and click that subscribe button. Clicking that subscribe button helps to make sure you never miss a new episode of the show. And while you're there, would you just take a moment to leave a review for me? Leaving a review really just helps me to know what you're liking and how the show is personally impacting you. As always, this show is produced by the amazing team at Third Wheel Media. Thank you so much for listening and go do something good with purpose on purpose. Now go do something good with purpose on purpose.